Uh, it's my great privilege to introduce a very distinguished, almost legendary figure in cosmology. Professor James Peebles is the Albert Einstein Professor at uh, Professor Emeritus at Princeton. Professor uh, James Peebles is a Canadian American physicist cosmologist. I use both the words because uh, in my mind one of his greatest uh, contributions has been he is part of the uh, generation of cosmologists who brought physical laws into cosmology, making it quantitative so that we now work in an era where cosmology is considered as a quantitative science that can be verified with measurements and it's actually becoming an area of precision science. Uh, Professor Peebles in his early days was amongst the architects of the modern Big Bang Theory and he is uh, very well known for the cold matter uh, scenario and one of the first people to talk about varying you know, cosmological constant or what is called the dark energy model. He is also extremely well known in the field for his two classic texts on cosmology and besides that he is of course very well regarded and he's won a lot of uh, awards, the Gruber Prize, Crawford Prize, Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. He even has an asteroid named after him. I just wanted to end with two things. Um, read in an interview of his that although he's a theoretical physicist, he loves to do things with his hands. And I think that's a message for the Indian students who prefer not to do so but do theory, that theoreticians do love to work with their hands, and they should. And uh, the other thing is that skills should evolve with, as the subject evolves. So one should not really you know, decide that this is all that I'm going to do in my life and you know, move on with the subject. So having said this, let me invite Professor James Peebles to deliver his lecture. remind you that we live on planet Earth, a beautiful place, abundant in resources, but very definitely limited. We live in an island universe. We're not alone. Here is another planet orbiting the sun. Well, the planet Jupiter. It has a core with composition similar to that of the Earth, and then a very deep layer of mostly hydrogen and helium. You're seeing the surface of that atmosphere, and you're seeing patterns generated by the flow of gas at the surface of Jupiter. Uh, thank you. And you see here uh, the great red spot. It's good to have a pointer, but I don't know how to make it work. <laughs> Never mind. I have very long arms, and I will remind you but that great red spot is a tropical storm. You see the wonderful vortex lines running away from it. You have seen similar images if you looked at storms on the surface of the Earth. The big difference is it's a much larger storm and it has lasted some 400 years. We have a moon. It is rocky, the surface marked by collisions by the interplanetary debris. Jupiter has several moons. Europa has a surface marked by cracks. It seems from ice that is floating on water in this moon. I pause to reflect at this point a lesson that is obvious but yet very important. Go to a different place where conditions are slightly different. You are apt to see surprising new things. We are not alone in our solar system. Here is a map. Oh, I wish you could use this thing. What shall I do? Or should I? Press that. Modern technology is a wonderful thing. I am showing you here a map of the nearby stars. There is a clever direction finder in this map. You see that if you follow this line horizontally, until you get to this point, go into the blackboard until you get to here and then down, you will hit another star. That one has two Jupiters circling around it. Many hundreds now of planets are known to have stars. 
none quite like Earth. Uh, the search, though, is going on. You will notice that the uh, sizes of the stars are greatly and exaggerated relative to the distance between stars, but the relative sizes of the stars are realistic. You notice the small stars, by and large, are red. They have low surface temperatures. Intermediate-sized stars like Sun have higher temperatures. The most massive stars in our neighborhood have the highest surface temperatures. A massive star shines brightly, burns its nuclear fuel rapidly, and explodes, leaving behind debris. Next to, well, now, next to that bright star in the middle is a, is a white dwarf, a star that began as perhaps twice the mass of Sirius, that evolved very rapidly, lost much of its gas, and ended up as a compact uh, white dwarf with composition mostly carbon and nitrogen. It is in a quiescent state, but it's dangerous, like a stick of, of, uh, of TNT. If you hit the right sort of spark in a stick of TNT, TNT it will explode, releasing chemical energy. The right spark on that little white dwarf will cause fusion to the peak of the binding energy curve for nuclear physics with a violent explosion, a supernova, of which I will speak more later. Here is a picture of the distribution of the nearer stars across the whole sky. Oh no, sorry, I must remind you that there are more massive stars. They tend to live near where they are formed because they don't live very long. You see here a gas cloud. It contains a little dust in it. The dust obscures light. You see light glinting on the edges of this gas cloud. That's from massive stars in behind, a birthplace for star formation. Here is the distribution of stars across the whole sky. The sphere has been flattened in order to show it, uh, distorting things slightly, but giving you the right picture. You notice that the stars are concentrated to a plane. That plane is a disk supported by a rotation. Uh, at the very center, although you can't see it, there is a black hole of the sort Kip discussed, this one weighing one million times the mass of the sun. This map was made uh, using long wavelengths, longer than the eye can see by a factor of about three, and they penetrate very much the, uh, the dust that obscures optical light. I should mention one other thing, that this is a map of roughly 1% of the stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. You can see that there is ample room for lots of planets. Those planets are under all kinds of conditions, we can be very sure, although we may never be able to check it, those planets are going to exhibit all kinds of wonderful behavior. Here is a map of our galaxy in optical light, where the obscuration by dust is important. You see the rifts, so-called dark bands, running through the plane of the Milky Way through the disk of our stars. That's not absence of stars, but simply the presence of dust that's obscuring the light. This is our island universe of stars. We're not alone. Here is another island universe of stars with properties very much like our own, seen face on, supported by rotation, the lines being marked out by dust that obscures starlight. The dust settles onto the disk. Where the dust is able to extinguish the starlight, the stars also must be on the disk. You can see, I hope, very close to the center, you can trace the dust, which is to say, the stars are in a flattened disk. This is a giant whirlpool, supported by rotation almost all the way to the center. At the center, there may be a black hole. It may be as massive as that of the Milky Way, but it's not known, not enough resolution yet to see what's at the very center of this galaxy. Here's another galaxy, again very flat. This one seen edge on. You see how wonderfully flat it is. Typically also, slightly warped, and you also see a stream of light, apparently smaller galaxy passed through this thing, got torn apart by tides, left its light, its little stars in this faint companion spread out along this beautiful arc. One percent of the light of this galaxy is in the stars right, rising out of the disk in these streams, one percent. Other galaxies have considerably more stars uh, out of the disk. Here you see a very prominent bulge of stars riding and rising out of the disk. These stars are generally old, have been there for a long time.
time, you see the disk of dust and the scattering of stars. Other galaxies don't have a disk at all. Uh, they look rather dull, as in this image. It's pure bulge, a smooth distribution of stars rising up to a very tight concentration in the center, at the center of which, in this galaxy, there is a black hole with a thousand times the mass of the one in the Milky Way, that is to say, around a thousand million solar masses. These black holes can be active. Uh, gas is being shed by the stars in these galaxies as they evolve. The gas tends to set up to the center, where it gets very tightly compressed into a disk, sheared and distorted to the, to the extent that you can compare to the effect of squeezing a tube of toothpaste really hard. What happens? A toothpaste will squirt out one end, and here you see a jet of relativistic matter emitting radio and optical radiation coming from the center, central black hole of this giant galaxy. Galaxies like to be together. Here is an example of a concentration of galaxies. Burned out at the center is the very central part of the cluster in which the density is very high. The di distribution of stars in density flares out, rising toward a very tight central portion and then flaring out into a mess on the edges with no discernible edge. It is very similar to the distribution of stars in one of those disc-free galaxies. It is called a rich cluster of galaxies. We may also call it a, a galaxy of galaxies. Here is a picture of this galaxy of galaxies uh, in front of the broader distribution of galaxies across the sky. This is about 45 degrees of sky, where the sky is fairly clear, normal to the plane of our galaxy. Where the image is bright, you are seeing a fair number of galaxies. Where the image is faint, you're seeing relatively few. Here you see this galaxy of galaxies in the foreground. This is the general texture of our universe. You will notice here something new, namely, as we went to larger and larger scales, we saw a new structure. Here, as we go to larger scales, we stop seeing new structure. This part of space is a lot like this part. This is the new development, the absence of new developments. And it is the key to the notion that we can make a theory of the universe. If, as we went to larger scales, we always saw, saw something new, then we could never hope to make a theory of the universe. It would only be a theory of that sort of that level in the hierarchy of structure. Because we start stop seeing something new, we can make a theory of what is happening here. It'll be the same as the theory of what's happening here. That is the whole point of our endeavor of cosmology. So, um, all of the images I've shown so far reflect enormous amounts of work by dedicated astronomers. And I thought it was good to pause to consider one of the people who did much of this work, Donald Shane, former director of the observatory on the west coast of California at Lick, Lick Observatory. He, in the 1950s, with his colleague Carl Wurtman, identified the million galaxies of which I show you a section. In those days, one didn't have high-speed computers or fast detectors. They found the galaxies by scanning scanning microscope on photographic plates. They recorded the data on paper. A copy of their data sheets is shown here on a top shelf of my office. They had no reason to think that anyone would ever be able to deal with a million numbers in those days before high-speed computers. Yet they took the data with such care that when high-speed computers came along, we, mainly clever graduate students, including Jim Fry, Ray Sinera, Mike Seldner, Bernie Siebert, off scale, uh, could take those data and make that beautiful plot and show it to Donald Shane and ask him, so is this what you saw? I remember vividly his words, I was looking at this one galaxy at a time. <laughs> this is the fruit of, of the unselfish endeavor. It took them 10 years. No reason to think the data would ever be used, but they took the data and it was used, and we got a thing, I would say, of beauty. 
a new picture of the texture of our universe. So now we come to the notion of an expanding universe. I give you this illustration from 1930. It hasn't changed in concepts. Imagine we live in two dimensions rather than the three of reality. Imagine those two dimensions are the surface of the sphere. So we are ants. We can crawl on this surface. We can't. There is no outside or inside as far as we're concerned. Imagine this, this sphere is expanding. It's a balloon being blown up. I'll discuss later this, this label and this curious figure. Notice that we are not expanding and our galaxy is not expanding, but it is the distance between galaxies that is increasing. You sit on a galaxy, you look at the neighboring galaxy, and you see them moving away from you. You see that the more distant the galaxy, the faster it's moving away. You can be able to say, therefore, the universe is expanding and it's expanding away from me. But of course, another galaxy, observer on another galaxy, would just see the same thing. The galaxy is moving away from that observer. The more distant the galaxy, the greater the recession rate. Everybody, it's a democracy, everybody may say the universe is expanding away from me. In a pattern uh, that was predicted before it was discovered, uh, here are some figures from that discovery. Hermann Weyl, great mathematical physicist and a close colleague of Albert Einstein, had the tentative idea of expanding the universe. That was turned into a mathematical solution to Einstein's theory by Alexander Friedman from Russia. He had the misfortune, however, to be born a little too soon before the astronomers had established evidence. I'll describe shortly that the universe really is expanding. The person who was born at the right time with the right intelligence and gifts and imagination uh, to do this was Georges Lemaitre. This photograph three years before he published a, an outstanding paper showing a, a independently discovered the solution of the Russian Friedman and showing how this solution could fit observations that the astronomers were starting to make. We should recognize the astronomers in this set of story also. Uh, on the left, I think, is the start of this. Uh, Percival Lowell was born of a very rich family in Boston, the United States. He augmented his personal inherited fortune on, on financial markets, but then turned his attention to astronomy. Astronomers honor his memory for his decision to build his observatory. He had that kind of money uh, and a very good site in the western United States and to hire excellent astronomers to build instruments for it and to use those instruments to make capital discoveries. Slipher was one of those astronomers. His capital discoveries, he showed that the galaxies of stars, those flat things I showed you, are supported by rotation. He used the Doppler shift. Light coming to me from a source that's moving toward me as its wavelengths scrunched together shifted toward the blue. The light coming to me from a source that's moving away from me as its wavelengths stretched the color shifted toward the red. He saw the red-blue shift across the disk of the galaxy, showing that it is rotating. He also saw that the galaxies seem to be moving away from us. The whole light is shifted toward the red. The astronomer on the right, Edwin Hubble, at an observatory still further west in the U.S., on the west coast, uh, Mount Hamilton, showed Mount Wilson. Mount, Mount Wilson. Mount Wilson, right. Uh, showed that the pattern of that apparent recession of the galaxies away from us fits Lemaitre's theory. Here is some of the data on that fit. The prediction, apparent recession velocity should increase linearly with distance. Here is the discovery paper. Maybe not that impressive. It is deeply impressive to me that within 10 years it extended that relation and tested it up to recession velocity 10% of the velocity of light. And that it took until the year 2000, uh, some 70 years, 60 years, 60 years later, before the next factor of 10 extension was created, showing the large scale recession motion and slight curvature to which I'll return. So we have the notion of uh, an expanding universe, and we have evidence of it from other directions, fossils from that hot big bang. Here is the astronomer George, George Gamow's idea, certainly after World War II. Weapons research during the war on nuclear bombs had taught physicists a lot about the properties of atomic nuclei. Gamow used those properties to predict that if the universe started out not only compact as it was expanding at the beginning of expansion, but also very hot, 
Then the thermonuclear reactors that people had studied during the war could make build up the elements. They would easily build up helium, deuterium, and he thought heavier elements. In fact, he was wrong about that, but he was quite right about the formation of helium. This hot early universe would be filled with thermal radiation. Standard physics, you relax to statistical equilibrium, you make thermal radiation. You recall the nature of that radiation, you tell me the temperature, I'll tell, me the, tell you the intensity of each wavelength. Very characteristic. Here is a photograph of the person who made many of the inventions that uh, were used to detect this gamma of radiation. Bob Dickey, my teacher at Princeton University, during the war, war research on radar, many inventions, including this microwave radiometer, which has the potential to measure thermal radiation. Here is a demonstration of that potential from the rooftop, just pictured. He scanned the sky. The sky has buildings with chimneys, some of which are warm. Here is the chart recording of what the reaction of this radiometer as it scanned around the horizon. Every time it passed over a hot chimney or hot building, it spiked. It's detecting thermal radiation. The actual discovery came 15, 25 years later, or 20 years later, uh, by Bell Telephone Laboratories in the U.S. who were developing ways of communications with microwave radiation. Thanks to this work, we can all Twitter. In this early experiment, they were communicating with, with they were experimenting with communication by with, with satellites. They had this very cleverly designed horn antenna in which radiation comes down into the horn, reflected sideways and down into it to the detector. Very sophisticated piece of equipment. Uh, not a sophisticated setup here. You notice the horn is supported by rough wood slats in a very crude hut. Inside the hut, though, a very sophisticated uh, instrument, which the engineers building had uh, taken very great care to understand all sources of noise. Here you see all catalog, the traveling wave laser in there. But you notice that they had a very curious assignment of noise. This very sophisticated antenna was supposed to allow two degrees effective temperature to rise up from the ground, crawl over the edge, and get into the instrument. Later people notice that that's certainly not the case. That this, this antenna is much better than that. They're detecting something new. The people who recognized that it's not the antenna, and that in fact this source of noise was entirely myster mysterious, were Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson. There you were using a larger version of the horn, but it had the same high quality. Here at exactly the same time are two people at Princeton, David Wilkinson and Peter Roll. Can you make out his plaid shirt? And he is standing there holding a screwdriver, looking very intelligent. Had built a Dickey radiometer at Dickey's suggestion to look for this radiation. When news of these two experiments was communicated, it was realized that the great problem Bell Labs had, and that these people were totally puzzled about, may be that they were detecting the radiation that the Princeton group was looking for. So here was the situation at the time, the discovery point, the Princeton point, a thermal black body spectrum. If this radiation is indeed relic radiation from the hot Big Bang, then its intensity at each wavelength should follow this black body curve. Demonstrating that that was the case took another 25 years. Uh, here are the two groups who finally pulled it off. Upper right. Uh, a NASA satellite experiment. The tallest person here, John, uh, John, uh, John, Ma Ma John Mather. Thank you. Uh, was a postdoc when he started. Took over heading this project. The project took 15 years. During that time, he didn't have many publications. He had his whole career invested in that experiment, which is going to be put on a rocket shot into space and of course with some probability was going to fall over and explode and he would have lost 15 years. A brave person and a well meriting the Nobel Prize he received for this experiment. Here is a competition, a Canadian group. Here is Herb Bush, the leader at the University of British Columbia in Western Canada. He used a rocket, in fact he used a series of rockets and in the latest experiment, latest version, he worked with 
Mark Halpern and Ed Wishno. Uh, I love this photograph because you ask yourself, do these people really know what they're doing? <laughs> but in fact, they did. They were a brilliant group of three. It took them 15 years to make their measurement. They came in within two months of each other. Here are their two results, either of which worthy of a Nobel Prize. It's a lesson here. Uh, Nobel Prizes are any prize, it's capricious. It depends on the actions of who got there first, and it depends, of course, on the actions of the many who gave them all of the pieces to put together to do the actions to make the great discovery. We should really talk about Nobel Prizes and the like as awards for the community for enormous effort by many people. Here is the modern situation in measurements of intensity as a function of wavelength, of frequency. Uh, here are the two brilliant experiments by the Canadian and the U.S. groups. And you can make out maybe the dots of the third theoretical curve. And look at that gorgeous fit between theory and observation. Dazzling. This is clear evidence that the universe expanded from a very different state. It's incapable of relaxing to thermal equilibrium now because it's transparent. We know that because you can see distant radio sources at these wavelengths. This must have been produced when the universe was different from now. This is a fossil, just as clear evidence of a hot Big Bang as our dinosaur footprints that most improbable creatures walked the face of the Earth. I remind you, I return to uh, the comfy distribution of galaxies. I remind you that the radiation is almost dead smooth across the sky, but on parts in 100,000, it does fluctuate up and down. These two fluctuations are intimately related. In the standard theory, in the early universe, things were hot enough that the matter was ionized thermally. The plasma coupled strongly to the radiation by electron scattering. The two act as a fluid with a very high pressure because of the radiation. That pressure oscillates rather like a bowl of jelly. The oscillation in a bowl of jelly has definite patterns set by the boundary conditions on the edges. These oscillations have definite boundary conditions set by the fact that we are expanding from a hot big bang. The result is that we leave patterns in the distributions of matter and radiation that are quite distinctive. Here are the patterns. Lower figure, the amplitude of fluctuations in the radiation as a function of wavelength. If you want to get slightly technical, this is the power spectrum, the square of the Fourier transform of the distribution of galaxies on large scales. This is the analog of the angular distribution of the radiation temperature across the sky. In technical terms, this is the square of the spherical harmonic transform of the temperature across the sky. See the bumps and wiggles, measured with exquisite accuracy in the case of the radiation. Pretty good here, too. See the theory. A solid line. See the discrepancy? That's annoying foreground source of galaxies at these, on these angular scales that are clumped enough and bright enough to get in the way. See the gorgeous fit along this part of the curve. It's dazzlingly good. This wonderful fit requires us to introduce two hypotheses. The first, that there is non-baryonic dark matter. Dark matter that interacts not at all with radiation. The idea that there is dark matter traces back to the great scientist Fritz Zwicky, uh, a character of, of, on his own, a character, and one who has to his credit many major advances. He has just the right set of skills for the first half of the, of the 20th century in astronomy. Uh, I spent much, many years of my life studying the data in this book on the nearby galaxies. Here is another, again a picture of a cluster, a rich cluster, a galaxy of galaxies. Swicky noticed that these galaxies are moving too quickly to understand according to the gravity that is in the mass in the stars in the, gal in the galaxy. Instead, it seemed that this thing is dominated by mass not in the galaxies, dark matter. Astronomers knew this puzzling problem for years and slowly built on it. Here is Vera Rubin uh, taking data uh, on the mass distribution around the galaxy. Here the puzzle was that the rotation velocity of the galaxy is almost close to flat 
out in the outer parts of the galaxy where there's very little mass and where you would expect the velocity to drop according to Kepler's law if the mass were all where the stars is. Again, you needed dark matter to understand why the circular velocity was so nearly independent of distance from the galaxy. You needed a second thing, uh, dark energy, or what used to be called Einstein's cosmological lambda, the constant lambda. Einstein had taken it for granted that the universe is static. You and I may be transient phenomena, but surely the universe is forever. In order to fit his theory of general relativity into a static universe, he had to counter, counter the, the tendency of gravity to cause the universe to collapse. He did that by modifying his theory to add a term with, known as the cosmological term with the cosmological constant in it, noted by the symbol lambda, so here's a backward lambda, that is repulsive and serves to hold the, stop the universe from collapsing. It was Georges Lemaitre's great dis discovery that uh, the universe, that, that condition is unstable. Disturb the universe a little bit, gravity will take over and start it expanding. That is the content of this, this comment by the Professor Dr. Willem de Sitter, director of the Leiden Observatory in the Netherlands. Whoever blows up the ball, why is the universe expanding or swelled up? That is done by the lambda, Einstein's cosmological term. Another answer cannot be given. When Einstein discovered that the universe is, seems to be expanding and that his lambda term is no longer needed, he wrote, away with the lambda. It's not needed, it is ugly, therefore I don't want it. Lemaitre did like it. Here is a photograph of, of Lemaitre in later years with Albert Einstein. Here is a letter Lemaitre wrote to Einstein in 1947 saying that he, Lemaitre, is going to contribute to a volume, Philosophers, a Library of Living Philosophers, that will still be on library shelves, it's a fascinating volume. Essays on Einstein and a long essay by Einstein. Uh, Lemaitre is proposing to talk about Einstein's cosmological constant and the arguments, now quite current, of why you should consider a cosmological constant. Einstein wrote back, uh, we're fortunate to have that letter too, uh, it was polite, he said, you may very well be right, but the tone of the letter makes it very clear to me. Uh, he really meant to say, you may be very well right, but, but I doubt it. <laughs> he was right, though. Uh, here is a key piece of the evidence that Lemaitre was right. This is showing expansion rate, brightness of objects those exploding carbon-nitrogen white dwarfs, uh, supernovae of a very specific type, whose luminosity can be calibrated to a very definite value. That means when you measure the brightness of the sky, brightness of the supernova in the sky, you have a very good measure of how far away it is. You have uh, a measure of how fast it's moving away from you. And the conclusion was that it, the rate of expansion of the universe is now increasing. Increasing. That's a signature of only one thing within the, the ideas we have. It's a signature of Einstein's lambda. These people are rightly, widely recognized for their contributions. Here, an earlier prize, the Shaw Prize, founded by Sir Run Run Shaw, well known and admired in China for his philanthropy, in particular support of education. He funded this Shaw Prize to bring attention to science and culture in, in Hong Kong and China. Uh, he is next to the central administrator of Hong Kong. The people carrying folders are awardees. These three were awarded the Shaw Prize, a very distinguished award, for this demonstration. Here is Saul Perlmutter, uh, Adam Reese, and, and the Brian Schmidt. The memory fails. Uh, I, I love this photograph because you can see Sir Run Run as a suit that is bespoke. It fits him if you know him. These guys, I've never seen them look so neat, but still, uh, their, seats, their suits were not bespoke. They later received the Nobel Prize for this brilliant work. And I've lost track of time. Oh! 
I won't use it all, but I will use a fair amount. I, I did not know how long it would take me to get this far. I, I, I have taught for years, I'm now retired, but taught for years. Uh, I was always able to present a 50 minute lecture. Somehow the clock would turn and I was out of there after 50 minutes. But somehow in public lectures I can never quite calibrate how far I'm going to get. So my plan here is to allow myself all the time I'm allowed talking about all these experiments that check what had been discovered in that last measurement. Namely, to check the notion that we need dark matter and we need dark energy. I should mention that dark matter really ought to be called the matter matter. He was the one who pointed out that Einstein's lambda really should be interpreted in terms of energy density of a very curious sort, to be sure. We need that Einstein's lambda or dark energy, and we need dark matter in order to understand the measurements of the large-scale nature of the universe. I will just describe a few examples. To begin with, stars. Stars in clusters rising above the disk in our galaxy tend to have a collection of stars all the same age. They differ, therefore, only in their masses. There's a range of masses of stars. I mentioned that the rate at which a star burns up its nuclear fuel and changes form very rapidly, tending to lose its mass, uh, is determined by its mass. And therefore, the range of masses placed cars, stars at different points on this plot showing surface temperature increasing to the left and luminosity increasing upward. This characteristic pattern follows lighter stars to heavier stars, to dying stars. And you see that this pattern, well, presented in two ways, depending on how you estimate that surface temperature down here, hot to the left, cold to the right, has a definite and specific shape that depends on how old the star cluster is. The age deduced is 13.5 giga years. With the astronomer's measurement of the rate at which the universe is expanding, this 13.5 giga years is older than the age of the universe if we don't have a cosmological constant. You see the role of the constant here is to cause the rate of expansion to increase so that the present rate isn't much, much less, it is much more than the rate earlier on. And therefore the early expansion was took longer and therefore you have an old, a greater time. It should be greater time since the Big Bang. In short, you require lambda to understand this, these data. Here is an absorption line system. Look at the spectrum of a distant quasar. You see a whole lot of absorption lines. That's light from clouds of, that's, that's due to clouds of atomic, of atomic hydrogen that are on the line of sight between the quasar and us. In each, in each uh, cloud of atomic hydrogen, you absorb the light at the resonant frequency from transition from the ground state to the first excited state. The lines are at different redshifts because they're at different distances and recall the expansion of the universe is shifting the radiation to longer wavelengths. Here is shown one absorption line greatly blown up. It's shown that there is the hydrogen absorption line and beside it the absorption line for the heavy isotope of hydrogen, deuterium. The ratio of these two is determined by the theory of the hot big bang in terms of the mass density in baryonic matter, the sort you and I are made of. The baryonic matter required to understand this ratio is much less than the mass of all material in the universe produced from gravity. That's the dark matter that's required. The ratio, the fraction of baryonic matter to dark matter is well explored in this galaxy of galaxies, a nearby cluster of galaxies. It contains hot plasma. Here is a, a, an image of the hot plasma cloud magnified, it's right in there toward the center, in x-rays. The hot plasma emits x-rays. Observations of the x-rays can allow people to determine the amount of mass in gas, add that to the amount of mass in stars, and compare that to the total amount of mass Fritz Wicke deduced from the motions of the galaxies. You find the baryonic mass fraction required to understand this system is the baryonic mass fraction required to account for this system. Glorious. You see that the nature of the game that's happening here. We are looking at the universe from many sides and finding a consistent story. That is why, despite the fact that the dark matter is truly hypothetical, no one's ever seen it. Maybe news from the CERN will come up someday and say we have it, but so far it's conjectural. Uh, Einstein's lambda, or dark energy, is equally conjectural. But yet we're convinced we need them. 
because we have looked at the universe from many different directions and found a consistent story. Everything fits together if we have those two conjectural materials. And so I think I will no, no longer fuss around about all of these. This is a rotation curve. Circular velocity is a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. Here is what you would expect if you had uh, no dark matter. Here is what you get. You need dark matter there. Here, masses of clusters of galaxies, again, a puzzling story. A masses of those clusters of clusters of galaxies and how they're distributed. A story that's very hard to understand if you don't have dark matter and dark energy. And so I conclude with a few thoughts. To begin with, the evidence is convincing that our universe expanded from a hot, dense state, very unlike the state of the universe now, the main fossil being that thermal black body radiation. The evolution of our universe is well described by Einstein's general relativity theory. That, to me, is an absolutely astounding result. For you recall that Einstein invented his theory with just a handful of bits of information. He knew about electromagnetism. He knew from his special relativity theory about the notion of space-time. He put those together and created a theory that he could test only within the solar system. The solar system has a size of about 10 to the 13 centimeters. People are now applying that theory on the scale of the Hubble length, the edge of the observable universe, which is 10 to the 28 centimeters. The theory has been extrapolated by 15 orders of magnitude and length scale. The theory survives that extrapolation. It's absolutely dazzling. The power of ideas on occasion are, are so great. On the other hand, of course, one understands the power of ideas can be equally misleading. Einstein wanted to throw away lambda, but it's there. Although I have stressed that we have a very convincing network of evidence for the hot Big Bang described by general relativity theory, it certainly does not mean we have the final theory. The nature of progress in, in the natural sciences is clear. We make progress by approximations. We have a theory, we test it, we make a model, we improve the model by doing new experiments. I don't think it's going to be any different in this subject. We have a, we have a good approximation, but we are leaving lots of challenges for your generation, and those challenges almost certainly are going to be solved in part by you. Among them, what is the nature of the dark matter? What is the meaning of Einstein's cosmological constant? What was our universe doing before it was expanding? You may hear from Professor Dick Bond about ideas on that score. And what are the ingredients of a still better theory? My bet is there is a better theory, uh, and I think it's up to you to find it. In short, uh, I feel that I am passing on to you, the younger generation, a fascinating set of challenges to keep you busy. And I think it is clear from the historical record that you will make great discoveries that will lead to new challenges for the generation after you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Such a fantastic talk. Um, we have time for a few questions. Star using redshift, you, you are, you are measuring, you are looking at the color and seeing how the color changes for the original color, but how do you know the original color of the star? One has, in the, in the star's spectral lines created by the atoms, the lines are shifting. So when I say color, I'm being imprecise. It is spectral lines. Why are galaxies flat and all are all galaxies flat? So, uh, why are the galaxies uh, flat? Oh, it's, it's it is thought that it is known, but I'm not sure at all it is. I mentioned that we have a, a good theory, but not necessarily a perfect one. The present theory does predict that galaxies would tend to spin. That's due to torques from neighboring galaxies as they're forming. But the spin will be far from perfect, and the, 
the current studies of how galaxies form in this standard theory show that there will be a lot of material above and below the plane of the galaxy, material that didn't get spun up enough. It would make a galaxy very much like those with a large bulge and a modest disk, of which there are many examples. It is an embarrassment, I believe, to the present theory that there are galaxies without any significant bulge. They're a real challenge. The conservative opinion is that, well, all right, it's a complicated theory. We will work it out. We will understand how pure disk galaxies form. But just possibly, uh, just possibly, we have a hint here of a better theory. What the better theory is is another matter, of course. Uh, one more question. In the distribution of galaxies, why are they not uniform? Oh, well, the same process that made a galaxy made that galaxy of galaxies and in general caused material to clump. Gravity attracts, and any small imperfection of the distribution of mass in the early universe grows through the attraction of gravity and becomes prominent. That part is understood. as clouds of hot gas. There are clouds showing signs that the jet went out first one direction, then the opposite direction, exactly. then this direction, but, but one at a time. Now, why that is, of course, is a matter of great research at the very moment. What brilliant research opportunity and a difficult one. Oh, no, but the recoil will certainly be absorbed by the mass of the black hole. It will shake a little bit, but it is much more massive than the mass in the jet. So the recoil is very modest. One last question. <coughs> what are your personal views about the universe actually? Means, uh, when it comes to Big Bang, the Big Bang was evolved from a singular point, a singular thing. And nowadays, the uh, string theory, satellite theory, are multi dimensional. So, what do you personally believe in? What should be how is the universe? What's your personal opinion? From Personal opinion, um, I do not believe the universe expanded from a singularity. So you support multi <laughs> uh, Well, I'm not sure I support any particular alternative to the singularity. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see some evidence. Evidence is accumulating. Uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a concept for what the universe was doing before it was expanding. Inflation, which could be part of string theory. Uh, that theory is attractive, that concept is attractive. I wouldn't call it a theory because it's not definite enough. And I don't know of any firm evidence that it actually happened, though there are hints. Until we have much more information and it's being accumulated, I think we should just say that we don't know what the universe was doing before it was expanded. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Peebles. <laughs> now we have a break for tea and we reconvene at uh, 4.25 sharp. Tea is out. <laughs>